We know of God's character, of God's righteousness, not just through keeping the laws, the rules and the regulations, the kind of things that we normally figure on, uh, that we count on to inform us what a good person is. We can tell a lot about God's character through the physical representation manifest in Jesus. Jesus was God with us. God who values the poor and the marginalized, children, widows, prostitutes, and fishermen. <laughs> he valued them just as highly and sometimes more so than those in society who are esteemed for their good breeding or their wealth or their connections or their success. While it's true that God has a tender spot for those who have been overlooked or forgotten or abused, God's democracy is absolute. In God's eyes, there is no one more equal or less deserving than others. This scripture points out the reason why. Everyone sins. Every single one of us. That some sin more and some sin less is not the point. It's like falling in the lake. You are just as wet if you fall in and climb out right away as you are if you happen to stay in and swim all day long. We all sin. We Presbyterians are usually made kind of uncomfortable by that thought. You've got to hand it to Catholics, even the non-practicing ones. They know about sin and the need for confession. They go into a little cubicle that pretends to offer a degree of anonymity and, and they recite the bad things they've done to a clergy person on the other side of the screen. From the time a child is deemed old enough to know right from wrong, usually about age seven, Rome Catholics are expected to give some thought about how they have sinned since they last confession. Now, we Presbyterians have a weekly general prayer of confession in most of our worship services. And of course, there's that line about forgiving others' debts and trespasses as we've been forgiven those very things. Whatever the heck that means nowadays. We like to think we are an Easter people. We don't spend much time lingering on Good Friday, and we sure don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about our sins. In fact, most of us would likely admit that we think we are, on the whole, pretty good people. Yeah, sure, you might lose your temper or swear or stuff like that, but we aren't like sinning sinners, sinner sinners, you know what I mean? And if by that we mean that most of us, I'm going out on a limb here anyway, aren't murderers or embezzlers, then I guess you're right. But the thing is that big or small, sin coats us all. There is no value in comparing sin according to God's way of looking at it. No one is better than anybody else, no matter what they've done or what they haven't done, no matter who they are or where they're from. The Apostle Paul says in this letter to the Christians in Rome that this certainly applies to the Jews who counted themselves as God's very own special people and therefore better than the Gentiles, meaning basically better than anybody else in the world. It would be like saying in our context that just because we're Christians doesn't mean that God sees our sin any different from that guy down the street who never goes to church and wears those disturbing t-shirts. God sees us exactly for what we are. We're human. We might try hard to follow Jesus, but the truth of it is, is that we all still 
fall short of his perfection, which is just another way of saying that we all fall short of the glory of God. God doesn't think that a Christian's poop smells like roses. Like everyone else, we stink too. So that's kind of a downer in a culture that is focused on self-actualization, whatever the heck that means. Our schools might give out ribbons for participation as a way of encouraging self-esteem, but don't fool yourself. Our society does not love losers. A good quarter of the shelf space at any bookstore is dedicated to self-improvement and personal success. There is no room for failure and sin in the church and out there in the world. If they understand it at all, sin is seen as failure. And it is. Certainly we may find ourselves easily and often failing the test when it comes to choosing right from wrong and when we know full well which is which and what would please God. But that special kind of failure, also known as sinning, is something that's right in our DNA. It's part of our human makeup. We just can't help it any more than trying to breathe underwater. A part of growing up is taking personal responsibility for our messes. Part of maturing spiritually is understanding that despite our best efforts, we sin. We are sinners without one plea. But once we realize that, that that's breakthrough. Like suffering from a disease like alcoholism, once we acknowledge that we have a problem, then we can begin to change our lives. Let alone under our own power, by our own will, it's just not going to happen. We can't do it. The first step of AA is to acknowledge there is a greater power than yourself. It is a power that you can lean into that you can lean on and you can ask to carry you when you just can't carry on anymore. For Christians, that power greater than ourselves is Jesus. This passage in Romans reminds us that, that when we couldn't stop sinning on our own and our spiritual debt had just spiraled out of control, Jesus settled the bill for us. He paid it all, and then some. We were free and clear. But we wonder, why did Jesus have to do that? Couldn't God just forgive? Well, if we remember a lot of the stories in the Old Testament, God actually had forgiven lots and lots of times. But so long as it was up to the people to keep their part of the bargain, and actually change their ways, things always broke down. So something had to be done. An ancient biblical understanding of justice was an eye for an eye. Jesus alludes to it in, in the Gospels, and he refers to it as easily as, as, as if it's just a completely natural saying. So we assume that everybody thought this. In first century society, it was uh, common, but it was actually far older than that. It actually comes from an ancient Iranian set of laws from 1700 years before Jesus talked about it. It was called Hammurabi's Code. But even into our own sort of recent era, into the medieval times, we know that the punishment for stealing a, a loaf of bread, for instance, would most likely mean amputation of the hand that took the bread. Punishment was still fitted to the crime. You might have heard the old English legal term, vergild. It's literally the man payment. 
as outlaw, outlined in Germanic law, this was the amount of compensation paid by a person committing an offense to the injured party, or in the case of a death, the amount of money that was due to his family. A man's Vergild was determined by his status in society. For example, in England, a feudal lord's Vergild could be many times that of a common man. And in certain instances, part of the Vergild was actually paid to the king, who had lost a subject and a vassal. So imagine the Vergild for the Son of God. Incalculable. But that's what all of this hinges on. The basis for criminal law was, this, this basis for criminal law was adopted by theologians like Anselm, Anselm of Canterbury and Thomas Aquinas. The idea was that punishment was a morally good response to sin. It was kind of like medicine for sin. And it would restore the relationship between the one who offends and the one who is offended. Sometimes it restores a relationship between us and sometimes it restores a relationship between us and God. The belief is, is that our sins break the relationship of love and trust and respect that should have been between us and God. We might say that if we had to pay up to get out of jail for our sins, we couldn't because we were flat out broke. And moreover, even if we did get out, we'd just be back in jail again because chances are we'd likely reoffend. We just can't help ourselves. But Jesus offered atonement, which if you write out the word, the word atonement looks like at one meant. Jesus paid for us all, made us one again with God by shedding his blood. He died not for his sins, but for ours. And that canceled out our debts with God forever and always. Scripture says that his vergild was so large that it was a ransom for many. Because you are human, you sin, even if you are a pretty good person. Even if we love God with all of our hearts, we're still going to sin. We are at times going to be jealous or selfish or irritable or hangry. We might choose to lie instead of telling the truth. We might harbor prejudices that stop us from seeing God in every person we meet. We might be too proud to accept or offer help. We might be so set in our ways that we hurt others trying to be kind. We may be intolerant of others who believe differently from us. We might care more about what others think than what God thinks of us. Just because we love God does not mean we stop sinning. Now, hopefully it means that we sin less. <laughs> when we acknowledge our sinfulness, though, it could go one of two ways. You could figure, well, if God understands that I sin and Jesus' sacrifice absolves me of sin, well, why not keep on sinning? The Apostle Paul says, yeah, you know what? You actually could do that. You'd be a jerk, but yeah, you could do that. <laughs> what he encourages us to do instead is to be aware of our sinfulness and to be grateful that Jesus has wiped our debt clean. So may we do everything we can to repay that kindness with love, and service, and discipleship, and devotion. Luke 7 tells of a woman who wept as she washed and anointed Jesus' feet when he was a guest at a fancy dinner. 
Now Jesus knew that her reaction of love and sorrow mixed up together came from a, a deep sense of gratitude for having had her sins forgiven. Jesus says to his host, do you see this woman? Yeah, I came into your house and you didn't give me any water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not offer me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins must have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. May our sense of gratitude for God's forgiveness of our many sins, large and small, be huge. May that gratitude move us to do our very best every day to live and love in a way that would be worthy of the price paid for us, literally a king's ransom, a price too great for any of us to comprehend. Amen. Thanks be to God.